Welcome back to Bumblebee. Here are the top 10 weirdest jobs in history. Kicking off the list at number 10, Plague Body Collector. Immediately into the dark and dirty. Here we go, we're not wasting any time today. Plague body collectors were vital back in the 14th century when bodies were quite literally starting to pile up. Somebody had to go in and somebody had to move them. That's pretty much this entire list. Eh, somebody had to do it. So using an old cart and a dirty rag only, they would have to carry plague-ridden corpses 28 city blocks away. Great job, we love it. They would also cover the bodies in flowers to prevent disease, or so they thought. Ah uh, yes, this tulip ought to prevent the plague. Number nine, galley rower. Ugh, my arms are tired just thinking about this job. Here we go, I gotta warm up. Back in the Middle Ages, if you were assigned to work on a galley, well, you better hope you were below deck scrubbing something with someone. Some sort of swashbuckler, something. I don't know, I've seen Pirates of the Caribbean once. If you were a galley rower, you would be tired all day long. Some large vessels had around a thousand crewmen. This was now a faster and more fierce way than any sail, but you needed a bicep or two, right? Benjamin Arbel, author of A Companion to Venetian History, states that back in the 1400s, a galley rower was one of the most detested obligations among Venice's colonial subjects. Yeah, obviously, they would do anything they could to avoid this position, which would sometimes include becoming a priest. Yeah, rowing a boat or Jesus, what's easier? They're like, Jesus, definitely Jesus. I don't blame them, I would hate that job as well. These noodles right here, this wouldn't do any good for any army. I'll complain about my arms being tired while in a paddle boat. You know what I mean? Think about that one. Number eight, cup bearer. One of the most important roles in the castle, of course, belongs to the cup bearer. I have a Yeti, also quite important. Yeah, these guys don't just sit in the corner and play the cup song on repeat, although that would be amazing. We're like, yes, more of that. This is the first piece of music we've ever had. No, they would serve royalty their drinks. They were responsible for making sure nobody has tampered with any cup. This was a noble spot to have. The king really needs to trust their cupbearer, obviously. The best part of this position was also the most dangerous. See, cupbearers were responsible for tasting the king's beverage each and every time. You know, to make sure there wasn't any poison. That's horrible. It's kind of good, though. I don't know. By the time dinner was over, Buddy probably had no idea which way was up. He's like, here you go, it's safe, and then immediately faints. Number seven, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? Wonder why, that's odd. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's absolutely disgusting, and dare I say, a bit of hogwash. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies, and then they would sell them to medical schools. All in the name of science. Gross, disgusting science. This was in the late 1820s, and at this time in Edinburgh, Scotland, the medical science community was on the up and up because of these guys. But in order to study new medicines to, you know, avoid the next plague, they needed to get dirty. I'll, I'll tell you what they didn't need, though. They didn't need William Burke and William Hare. See, these two Irish brothers, they were both resurrectionalists who were running out of patience and money. So they themselves would end up taking people out and then proceed to sell their corpses right after. They did this 17 times. They killed 17 people all in the course of two years. Then they sold their corpses to one Dr. Robert Knox. Yeah, it took 17 killings before somebody caught on to the system of theirs. Hare testified against Burke, so Burke got the old gallows treatment and was publicly dissected. His skeleton is actually hilariously enough, still on display at the Edinburgh Medical College Museum to this day. So if you wanna go flip off a skeleton, there you go. Number six, fullers. Ancient Romans were pretty creative, dare I say. That's what we'll say about that. Recently, we did a list on dark medical practices used in history, and in that list, we talked briefly about how urine was used by ancient Romans to, you know, whiten their smile. We love that, fresh breath guaranteed. They also used urine to wash their clothes. They didn't use soap because the amount of ammonia in your pee often did the trick. Again, creative. Lye was also used to clean clothes at this time, but it was pricey, so plan B was to head down to the old laundromat and then hand your dirties over to a fuller. Yeah, these lucky lads would have to stand in a tub filled with chemicals, water, and, well, yes, lots of urine, and then just stomp. Just stomp and scrub for hours. Urine collected from all over town. How lucky is that guy? And of course, most of the time, they would get extremely ill, obviously, just breathing that in. From one of the many poisons that they're splashing around in, that'd be the worst job. Ugh, this should have been number one, but it's not. Trust me, it's not. Number five, ewerer. Ah, yes, the ewerer. That's an easy word to say right there. Ewerer. Ewerer. While water carriers were responsible for carrying fresh water supplies throughout town, the ewerer was responsible for nobles and their water supply. Yeah, see, these lucky lads had the misfortune of transporting boiling hot water 
you know, for tea, hand washing, a hot bath, you name it, all that nice stuff. Anything you desire that requires boiling hot water from all the way across town, well, the calm e has your back. What a stressful job. Uneven stone roads, good luck not spilling all over yourself. Number four, a scribe. Scribes would copy texts, something that would take months, right? It would be a horrible job. My wrist hurts sometimes filling out my name. I'm like, oh, I haven't done this in years. You ever read the terms and conditions to an iPhone? Imagine life before copy and paste. You had to write that out. It was a process. I mean, first you had to convince somebody to let you, you know, borrow their codex. Yeah, people don't trust me with their phone chargers, let alone their codex, okay? You take that for months at a time, of course, at a high cost, a lot of trust there, because many didn't know how to write. And to be fair, if I magically got transported back to the Middle Ages, they wouldn't be able to read my chicken scratch at all. Also, ink? Good luck, no way, I cannot do it. I'm barely figuring out pens today. If you dabbled in calligraphy, this was the job for you. But again, it wasn't an easy job. Imagine trying to write out the speech of a drunken king. You're like, did he say wither or thither? I don't even, this guy's asleep. Number three, lector. Long before Spotify or even before the miracle worker herself that is LimeWire, if she rests in peace, couldn't have grown up without her. Factory workers needed entertainment to distract themselves from the repetitive, horrible tasks all day long. I mean, we're talking about a time where women were making arsenic dresses for a living. This was long before the labor board ever existed, right? It was all bad. It's 1929, workers are treated like complete trash, so they decide to liven up the work day by bringing in a lector. A lector would read the news or literature out loud to workers all day long, every single day out loud with bad breath. It sounds like a nice gesture on paper, but in reality, factory workers were then forced to pitch in portions of their own pay in order to fund these guys. Yeah, they would have to make less money to hear Schmo Rogan talk about politics all day. That's horrible. Not everybody was on board here, so naturally thousands of workers ended up going on strike because, you know, this guy wouldn't shut up. I mean, some cases, sure, entertain away, but if you need to focus all day long, maybe using small parts, maybe you're repairing a watch or two, it's kind of hard to get your job done when dude's in the corner trying to figure out commas, you know what I mean? He's like, eh, and I'll huff, and I'll puff, and uh, what's this word? You're like, guy, I'm trying to make an arsenic watch. Please shut up. Number two, watching paint dry. Before we get to our big bad number one, I have to include this modern curveball. I can't believe this is a real job. This is hilarious. There's a man in his late 30s right now named Dr. Thomas Kerwin. Sorry, he's not a man. He's a doctor. A doctor who makes a living by watching paint dry. Yes, this man currently works for Dulux Paint, and he studies paint under a microscope and also as it paints on a wall. He has to time it. This makes sense. When fast drying paint is a main selling point, somebody, again, needs to do this job. Somebody's gotta figure that out, right? And that somebody here is Dr. Thomas Kerwin. What a champ, that's amazing. When asked about his profession on catersnews.com, Dr. Thomas replied, people think I stare at walls, constantly checking my watch, i.e. me, to time how long it takes. If that was the case, I would be bored out of my mind. Fortunately, when you look under a microscope, it brings everything to life. A liter of paint consists of a million billion particles. So there's plenty to see before the paint even hits the wall. A million billion, that's something like that's made up. Yeah, there's a million billion particles in this paint. 26.99 a can. Here you go. Look at this green, we actually painted this. Dulux green, it was great, you wouldn't even guess. Number one, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off golfing, you know, doing stuff that matters. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool though, that, that's a bit much. That was a bit too close for me, I think. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool, but you never know. I will definitely apply, let's do it. Back in the dark ages, this role again was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII and this role was to assist the king, specifically assist his bowel movements. Grooms of the stool had a box that they carried with them at all times and that's where the magic happened, the dark magic, that is. And you would literally follow the king until he needed you. Porta potties weren't a thing at this time and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods behind a bush. You're not gonna catch King Henry VIII like, hey, don't look, do you have any leaves? No, not at all. In fact, you wouldn't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for said groom of the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? Yuck. In this stool, you would have water, hopefully, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell? Uh, sight, hopefully, everything? 
Nope. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every single room in the castle, and tons of clothes, and any bedchamber, furnishings, anything they want, and of course, a higher pay. Guys, those are the top 10 weirdest jobs in history. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and we'll see you next time for some gross, disgusting history. Bye. You're in trouble. Uh, you're in trouble. That's a good, good title. You got a bit. Believe in it. Believe in it. It'll look good in post.